Okay, so uh, the next study that we're going to look at is Murray's study. So Murray is looking at an idea of attention. Okay, so um, we first need to think about um, attention and how that appears to work from previous research. So we think attention has a selective nature. So in other words, you pick what you attend to. So Broadbent argued that to cope with the flood of available information, humans must selectively attend to only some of the information in front of us and somehow tune out the rest. So the idea behind that is that our brains are being constantly bombarded with information from our senses. Um, and this means that in order for our cognitive processes to actually cope with that, we need to filter some of that out, okay, and pick and select what we actually attend to. Uh, and therefore, attention is the result of a limited capacity information processing system. So in other words, at limited capacity, you can only process so much. Um, and the information is that kind of sensory information that um, you kind of take in through your senses. So early models of attention assumed serial processing. Um, this is a step by step process in which each operation is carried out in turn. So the first of this was that um, the filter model suggested by Broadbent. So Broadbent's filter model essentially suggested that you have a sensory store. Now, both um, attended messages and unattended messages. So those that you do kind of um, have uh, bombarding your senses will enter that sensory store and then that goes through a selective filter um, and that might be based upon physical properties so things like pitch and loudness so particularly loud things you might um, select or things with a different pitch you might select and anything which is unintent unattended to so isn't selected at that point is then blocked out and then that's kind of bottlenecked down into higher level processing and then you remember that information. So that was the first one um, and then other models came after that. Now there are two methods really of studying attention. So in order to study um, attention you might look at uh, dividing attention. So when you look at dividing attention you appear to present participants with two or more simultaneous messages and you ask them to respond to all or both of the messages. So I might play like one sound into one ear and another sound into the other and I'd ask you to pay equal attention to both. Okay. Um, whereas you can do something called shadowing, um, which we're going to talk about a bit more in a second, and that focuses attention um, on a particular message using a dual task method. OK, um, now what that would be is using selective attention. So in selective attention, people are presented with two or more simultaneous messages. So again, a sound into one ear and a different sound into the other. And I would instruct you to process and only respond to one of them. Now, the most popular way of doing this is that shadowing that I just mentioned. Um, so we would feed one message into the left ear and a different one into the right through a pair of headphones. And you would be asked to repeat one of those messages aloud as you hear it. OK, so in shadowing, if I um, said a sentence, you would also repeat the sentence. You wouldn't wait till I finished the sentence. You would repeat it word by word after me. Um, now, this shadowing technique is a form of what you call dichotic listening. So this was first used by a researcher called Cherry when he studied something known as the cocktail party phenomenon. So the cocktail party phenomenon is the idea that, um, you know, when you're at a crowded party, as a cocktail party as the name suggests, so a crowded party and it's very loud and it's quite busy, there's a lot of voices and yet somehow... If you're having a conversation with one other person or even a small group of people in that very crowded, busy environment, you can hear what they're saying, whereas the rest of it appears to be kind of a droning noise. And that's the cocktail party phenomenon or effect.
So in dichotic listening tasks, these tasks are presenting those two different audit, auditory stimuli or two different messages uh, through headphones. So participants shadow one of these messages aloud as they listen. And in doing this, they're focusing their attention on the shadowed message and they're blocking out the other one. So if I had told this fella to shadow his left ear, then he would hear this phrase and he would be repeating this phrase, which means that the information that's presented to his right ear is actively being blocked out, otherwise known as a rejected message. And that's a dichotic listening task. So, um, Cherry's method, uh, method sorry, of shadowing one of two dichotic messages in his study, um, which he used looking at the cocktail party effect, um, were ignorant of the content of the message. Okay. So all the researchers have gone on to build upon Cherry's work on how people can attend to one particular message by investigating why when you are paying attention to one particular message, you seem to remember so little about the other conversations. And so the aim of the first experiment in this study was really kind of testing Cherry's findings in a more rigorous scientific way. And the second and third experiments, so there are three experiments here in total, aim to investigate other factors that can affect your attention. So are there any things which are important enough to, to suddenly make you start paying attention to information that you are currently rejecting? So while we are paying attention to one message, that's the one that you're shadowing, we appear to set up a block or an inattentional barrier to any others. Um, and this only focuses our intention on the um, selected message. So it's kind of like, you know, when you're talking to somebody and they're busy looking at the phone or the texting, something like that. And so they can't hear you at all. Um, even when you're talking to them because they're paying attention so much to what they're texting. So it's that kind of idea. They're focused all their attention on like the message that they're sending. And so they've set up a block or an inattentional barrier to anything else. And therefore, that's why they they can't hear you. So Murray was interested in what types of message could penetrate this block and would be paid attention to by the participants. So we aim to find out which factors would enable an unattended, dichotically presented message to be noticed. OK, so when you're presenting two messages at the same time, one's being shadowed and the other one's being rejected, what kind of things will make you suddenly start paying attention to that rejected message? So these were all done in a lab. They had high levels of control. They had IVs and DVs, which means that they are all lab experiments. They used a standard apparatus in each of these experiments. Uh, the first one of these apparatus is a Brennell Mark IV stereophonic tape recorder. OK, so that's this device here so it like comes in a case with like a clear lid over it and then you basically play the tapes would um kind of go around on these and then it would play sound now they used one of these but this was modified with two amplifiers so that two independent outputs would be delivered through each of the earpieces of a pair of headphones so that this headphone would play one message and this headphone would play a completely separate message. Now, when participants were wearing those headphones and hearing two messages, um, they these messages were matched for their loudness, but they were only matched approximately. So how we matched them was we didn't measure the level of sound, uh, but what we did was we asked participants to say when the two messages that they could hear seemed equally loud and this was usually kind of within one decibel of each other in terms of seeming equally loud so not saying they're exactly the same but when they seem to be within a, at least a decibel of each other
there were a few other controls used. So participants uh, first had to complete four trial shadowing tasks on passages of prose. And this was just as practice before the study so that their, their ability to remember information from these passages um, wasn't actually affected by the fact that they'd never done shadowing before and therefore that practice throw, uh, was to throw them. So they practiced four times. Uh, the loudness of each passage was approximately 60 decibels above the participant's hearing threshold. So it was, it was kind of moderately loud. The speech rate was approximately 150 words per minute, um, apart from in one task, which I will give you a bit more detail on. And all passages were recorded by one male speaker. So all that is kind of generally standardised. Uh, participants were all undergraduates and research workers and there was a mixture of males and females however in experiment one we don't actually know how many participants there were in experiment two there were 12 participants and in experiment three we actually used two different groups of participants and there was 14 participants in each group okay so there was um, a total of 28 participants but 14 in each group okay and um, that is pretty much all the detail that we have on that sample so we don't know kind of the mix of male and females ages anything like that that's all the information we have So what we're going to do is just go through each of the three experiments, but I'm going to talk about what happened in the experiment, and then the results, what happened, then the results, what happened, then the results, just so that um, you don't get confused between what results go with what experiment. So in experiment one, um, the, they um, presented a short list of simple words to one ear. And this was a short list, so it had to be repeated several times. And in the other ear, they heard uh, a prose, okay, so a passage. Now, they had to um, shadow the prose while the short list of simple words was repeated 35 times. So the word list was faded in after the shadowing had begun, okay? So they started playing the passage first, you shadow the passage, and then just after you'd started doing that, they began to fade in these um, 35 repetitions of a short list of words. Okay, and then that was faded out again at the end. Now, the participant was then asked to report um, all... Of the content they could from the rejected message so the rejected message was the list of words the one that they're not paying attention to and we're just given a recognition test now that recognition test had 21 words on it uh, and you had to um, pick which ones you actually remembered hearing in either of the passages so in either the list of words or the short passage so um, in this 21 words, seven words were actually from the shadowed message, seven were from the rejected message, and seven were controls. So they were just other words that hadn't been in either the word list or the passage, but were put in there just to check that people kind of weren't just saying, yes, I heard all of these. So as a control. Uh, now, the gap between the end of the shadowing and the beginning of the recognition test was about 30 seconds. OK, so they would shadow. While this rejected message of a short list of words was repeated, it would wait 30 seconds and then they would complete these two tasks. So as um, the independent variable is the message or the word type, so whether it's the kind of the shadowed or the rejected, and all participants heard shadowed and rejected messages and were given the word lists of shadowed and rejected messages to pick from and um, then the independent variable is that and that means that it's a repeated measures design because all participants took part in both conditions and the dv is the number of words recognized 
So here are the results. So um, the mean number of words recognised out of seven for the shadowed message, this is the one that they were paying attention to because they were repeating it. So the passage of prose um, is five out of seven or 4.9, but you can round it up to five. So that means that 70% of the words um, that were presented in that um, recognition task were remembered compared to only 27% as they on average only remembered two words from the rejected message and actually the average amount of people who um, said that they remembered one of the control words but obviously did not is three so actually you can see there that you are equally likely to um or well kind of similarly likely to say that you have um recall words that actually you never heard as you are to actually recall words from the rejected message okay now these findings were significant at one percent so it's a significant finding that you are more likely to recall the shadowed message words participants remembered very few words from the rejected message despite the fact that they did hear those few words repeated 35 times now um, some people have said perhaps it's because um, there was a 30 second delay and that's why you couldn't recall any of the words but actually if the 30 second delay was going to affect your ability to recall um, information from the rejected message or recognise information from the rejected message, then surely it would also affect that in the shadowed message, and clearly it didn't. Okay, now these findings generally support Cherry's ideas. So, uh, in experiment one, so here we are, so we've got a rejected message, just a list of words being presented, and a shadowed message of a passage. So participants recall 27% uh, of words from this message, but 70% from this message. Now in experiment two, uh, so this is one of the two experiments as part of this research that was aiming to see what kind of information appeared to be important enough to break through that inattentional barrier. So in this experiment, uh, they shadowed 10 short passages of light fiction. So they were told that their responses would be recorded and that the object of the experiment was for them to try and score as few mistakes as possible. So they were basically given instructions in this um, to switch which ear they were shadowing so obviously like I say you're getting one message or one of these short passages through the left ear and another separate passage through the right ear so the instruction was basically to kind of switch ears so to switch which message they are shadowing so these instructions were, were either affective or non-affective so an affective instruction would be one that was preceded by the participant's own name so for example an affective instruction for me would be Bethan switch to your other ear whereas a non-affective message would just be switch to your other ear for example so um, half of the instructions uh, given were affective Participants were classified as having heard the instruction if they followed it, so if they kind of actually did switch um, which passage they were shadowing, or if they, towards the end of the piece of research, said that they had heard it. So the um, independent variable is whether the instructions were affective or non-affective, and all participants um, across the 10 passages heard a mixture of both, meaning that it's a repeated measures design, whereas the dependent variable was this, so the number of times that they heard it through either following the instruction or saying that they had heard it. Uh, now, just to show you the order of these, so these are the orders of the instructions, so they would hear um, kind of 20 pieces of light fiction in total, because remember they're hearing um, two in each, one through the left ear, one through the right ear. So they were given some instruction at the start of the passage and then some instructions within the passage. 
So the instruction at the start of passage one, for example, was listen to your right ear. And then within the passage there, they've been given a non-effective instruction of, all right, you may stop now. Uh, listen to your right ear. And then they weren't given an instruction in the passage. Uh, listen to your right ear. And then they were given an affective instruction there. So, for example, John Smith, you may stop now. OK, so um, what you can see is I have split up these instructions um, as three of the in passage instructions were affective and they were um, passage three, passage seven and passage ten. So the ones that are in red, uh, three of these were non effective. So they're the ones that are in yellow. So passage one, passage five and passage eight. And four of these, they weren't given any instructions. So these were passage two, four, six and nine. They were given no instruction. OK, and you can see, like I say, that in two of these, uh, they were kind of uh, told that they were going to receive an instruction to change to the other ear. But only in two of them. So the no instructions passages were interpolated. So in other words, inserted in the table at random. Um, the passages were read in a steady monotone voice at about 130 words per minute and participants responses were tape recorded and later analysed so them kind of shadowing the messages was tape recorded and then we could then kind of play that back and analyse whether they did switch ear or whether they said or oh, did you say my name or anything like that so whether that instruction was actually acknowledged or not So um, if the instructions were given in the passages that they were shadowing, then most participants tended to ignore these instructions as they tended to say that they thought this was an attempt to distract them from their shadowing task. Uh, the table here relates to where instructions were presented in the rejected message. So you can see here from these figures that when a non-effective instruction, so one such as change ears or you can stop now, so not preceded by the participant's name, is inserted, this was only heard four times, whereas uh, the number of times that an effective one was heard was 20. OK, um, so this data therefore indicates that the presence of a person's own name in the rejected message can cause an instruction to be heard. So you're more likely to pick up on information in a rejected message if it is preceded by your name. So perhaps your name is an important enough piece of information to break through that inattentional barrier. Just to note up here as well at the top to say that actually this should be 36. So there should have been 36 sets of affective instructions in the rejected message. However, there appears to be more because um, actually those who heard the instructions and then actually changed ear um, meant that the second time that they heard instructions, they should have heard it as the shadowed message but actually they were now hearing the rejected message because they'd had a message in the um in there to switch ears and then they actually did switch ears so they heard basically the kind of incorrect message and then followed would you know hear that effective instruction again um and all of these ended up occurring in passage 10 so all of these extra ones came from passage 10 so that's really just a note to say why there are a differences in the number of uh, affective and non-affective when it should be the same because remember we had four um no three sorry three affective and three non-affective so that should have been the same but obviously it isn't for that reason and so what we find here is that participants rarely heard the instruction in the rejected message when they are not preceded by their name. So only 11% of the time are we hearing that message in comparison to when it was effective and then we are hearing it 51% uh, of the time, so a lot more often.
And finally, experiment three. So experiment three is really interested in, is it just a person's uh, name that is important enough to break through the inattentional barrier? Or is it that we can see that other information is equally as important if we prime you to look out for it or listen out for it in this case. Um, so Murray conducted the third experiment to test this idea. So the participants this time were given instructions that they were either in a dichotic listening task, going to be asked questions about the shadowed message at the end, or they were given instructions that they were specifically going to need to remember as many digits as possible. Okay, now they were given one of the two instructions, so they're just doing this task once. So this is actually an independent measures design. The dependent variable was the number of digits correctly recalled. So participants um, were shadowing a message and rejecting a message in a dichotic task, just as they have in the previous experiments. And in some of these messages, digits were interpolated towards the end of the message. And remember, by interpolated, we just mean they inserted digits. These were sometimes present in both messages, they were sometimes present in only one message. Okay, there was also uh, controls that had kind of no digits in, randomly inserted. Okay, so what we found was that there was no significant difference between the number of digits correctly recalled in each condition. So this shows that the participants couldn't actually be primed to respond to digits in a rejected message, unlike experiment two where they spontaneously responded to their own name without being primed. So what that might suggest is that your name is an important enough feature to you that actually, even if we don't tell you to listen out for your name, you're likely to pick up on it. However, in comparison, numbers are clearly not that important in terms of attention because even where we've said you must listen out for these numbers because we're going to test you on numbers at the end, the numbers are still not important enough to break through that barrier. So in conclusion, when a person directs his or her attention to a message from one ear and rejects a message from the other ear, almost all of the verbal content from the rejected message is blocked. So evidence from this comes from experiment one. Another conclusion is that this rejection is apparent even when the message is repeated many times. So again, in experiment one, we repeated that rejected message 35 times and yet only 27% of those words were recalled. Conclusion three, subjectively important messages such as your own name can penetrate the block. So we may hear instructions in the rejected message if the instruction contains our own name. And obviously that's using the figures of 51% compared to 11%. And finally, it is very difficult to make neutral material, and that's our numbers, and perhaps even impossible, to make that important enough to penetrate the block. And evidence for this comes from that final experiment.